The Foghorn by Ray Bradbury Out there in the cold water, far from land, we waited every night for the coming of the fog, and it came, and we oiled the brass machinery and lit the fog light up in the stone tower. Feeling like two birds in the grey sky, MacDun and I sent the light touching out, red, then white, then red again, to eye the lonely ships. And if they did not see our light, then there was always our voice, the great deep cry of our foghorn shuddering through the rags of mist to startle the gulls away like decks of scattered cards and make the waves turn high and foam. It's a lonely life, but you're used to it now, aren't you? asked MacDun. Yes, I said. You're a good talker, thank the Lord. Well, it's your turn on land tomorrow, he said, smiling, to dance the ladies and drink gin. What do you think, MacDun, when I leave you out here alone? On the mysteries of the sea. MacDun lit his pipe. It was a quarter past seven of a cold November evening, the heat on, the light switching its tail in two hundred directions, the fog horn bumbling in the high throat of the tower. There wasn't a town for a hundred miles down the coast, just a road which came lonely through dead country to the sea, with few cars on it, a stretch of two miles of cold water out to our rock, and rare few ships. The mysteries of the sea, said Madun thoughtfully. You know the ocean's the biggest damned snowflake ever. It rolls and swells a thousand shapes and colours, no two alike. Strange. One night, years ago, I was here alone, when all of the fish of the sea surfaced out there. Something made them swim in and lie in the bay, sort of trembling and staring up at the tower light, going red, white, red, white across them, so I could see their funny eyes. I turned cold. They were like a big peacock's tail, moving out there until midnight. Then, without so much as a sound, they slipped away. The million of them was gone. I kind of think, maybe, in some sort of way, they came all those miles to worship. Strange. But think how the tower must look to them, standing seventy feet above the water, the god-light flashing out from it, and the tower declaring itself with a monster voice. <laughs> they never came back, those fish. But don't you think for a while they thought they were in the presence? I shivered. I looked out at the long grey lawn of the sea stretching away into nothing and nowhere. Oh, the sea's full. MacDun puffed his pipe nervously, blinking. He had been nervous all day and hadn't said why. Come on, I got something special I've been saving up to tell you. We ascended the eighty steps talking and taking our time. At the top, MacDun switched off the room lights so there'd be no reflection in the plate glass. The foghorn was blowing steadily, once every fifteen seconds. Sounds like an animal, don't it? MacDun nodded to himself. A big, lonely animal, crying in the night, sitting here on the edge of ten billion years, calling out to the deeps. I'm here. I'm here, I'm here. And the deeps do answer. Yes, they do. About this time of year, he said, studying the murk and fog, something comes to visit the lighthouse. I've put off telling you, because you might think I'm daft. Tonight's the night it comes. Just sit down there. If you want, tomorrow you can pack your duffel and take the motorboat into land and get your car parked there at the dinghy pier on the Cape and drive on back to some little inland town and keep your lights burning nights. I won't question or blame you. It's happened three years now, and this is the only time anyone's been here with me to verify it. You wait and watch. Half an hour passed, with only a few whispers between us. One day, many years ago, 
a man walked along and stood in the sand of the ocean on a cold, sunless shore and said, We need a voice to call across the water to warn ships. I'll make one. I'll make a voice like all of time and all of the fog that ever was. I'll make a voice that is like an empty bed beside you all night long, and like an empty house when you open the door, and like trees in autumn with no leaves. A sound like the birds flying south, crying, and a sound like November wind and the sea on the hard, cold shore. I'll make me a sound and an apparatus, and they'll call it a foghorn, and whoever hears it will know the sadness of eternity and the briefness of life. The foghorn blew. I made up that story, said Macdon quietly, to try to explain why this thing keeps coming back to the lighthouse every year. But, I said, Sst, said Macdon, there. He nodded out to the deeps. Something was swimming toward the lighthouse tower. And then, from the surface of the cold sea, came a head, a large head, dark-colored with immense eyes, and then a neck, and then not a body, but more neck and more. The head rose a full forty feet above the water on a slender and beautiful dark neck, only then did the body, like a little island of black coral and shells and crayfish, drip up from the subterranean. There was a flicker of tail. In all, from head to tip of tail, I estimated the monster at ninety or a hundred feet. Steady, boy, steady, whispered Macdon. It's impossible, I said. No, Johnny, we're impossible. It's like it always was ten million years ago. It hasn't changed. It's us and the land that have changed, become impossible. Us! It swam slowly and with a great dark majesty out in the icy waters, far away. The fog came and went about it, momentarily erasing its shape. One of the monster eyes caught and held and flashed back our immense light, red, white, red, white, like a disk held high and sending a message in primeval code. It was as silent as the fog through which it swam. It's a dinosaur of some sort. I crouched down, holding to the stair rail. Yes, one of the tribe. But they died out. No, only hid away in the deeps. Deep, deep down in the deepest deeps. Isn't that a word now, Johnny? A real word. It says so much. The deeps. The foghorn blew. And the monster answered. A cry came across a million years of water and mist. A cry so anguished and alone that it shuddered in my head and my body. The foghorn blew. The monster roared again. The foghorn blew. The monster opened its great toothed mouth, and the sound that came from it was the sound of the foghorn itself, lonely and vast and far away, the sound of isolation, a viewless sea, a cold night, a partness. That was the sound. No, whispered Macdon, do you know why it comes here? I nodded. Perhaps it's a million years old, this one creature. Think of it, waiting a million years. Could you wait that long? Maybe it's the last of its kind. I sort of think that's true. I saw it all. I knew it all. The million years of waiting alone for someone to come back who never came back. While the skies cleared of reptile birds, the swamps dried on the continental lands, the sloths and saber-tooths had their day and sank in tar-pits, and men ran like white ants upon the hills. The foghorn blew. The monster was only a hundred yards off now, it and the foghorn crying at each other. As the lights hit them, the monster's eyes were fire and ice, fire and ice. That's life for you, said Macdon. Someone always waiting for someone who never comes home. 
Always someone loving something more than that thing loves them. And after a while you want to destroy whatever that thing is, so it can't hurt you no more. The monster was rushing at the lighthouse. The foghorn blew. Let's see what happens, said McDonne. He switched the foghorn off. The ensuing minute of silence was so intense that we could hear our hearts pounding in the last area of the tower, could hear the slow, greased turn of the light. The monster stopped and froze. Its great lantern eyes blinked. Its mouth gaped. It gave a sort of rumble, like a volcano. It twitched its head this way and that, as if to seek the sounds now dwindled off into the fog. It peered at the lighthouse. It rumbled again. Then its eyes caught fire. It reared up, threshed the water, and rushed at the tower, its eyes filled with angry torment. McDon, I cried, switch on the horn! McDon fumbled with the switch, but even as he flicked it on, the monster was rearing up. I had a glimpse of its gigantic paws, fish skin glittering in webs between the finger-like projections, clawing at the tower. The huge eye on the right side of its anguished head glittered before me like a cauldron into which I might drop, screaming. The tower shook. The foghorn cried. The monster cried. It seized the tower and gnashed at the glass, which shattered in upon us. MacDun seized my arm. Downstairs! We reached the bottom as the tower buckled down toward us. We ducked under the stairs into the small stone cellar. There were a thousand concussions as the rocks rained down. The foghorn stopped abruptly. The monster crashed upon the tower. The tower fell. We knelt together, McDonough and I, holding tight, while our world exploded. Then it was over, and there was nothing but darkness and the wash of the sea on the raw stones. That and the other sound. Listen, said McDonough quietly. Listen. First a great vacuumed sucking of air and then the lament, the bewilderment, the loneliness of the great monster folded over and upon us. The monster gasped and cried. The tower was gone. The light was gone. The thing that had called to it across a million years was gone. And the monster was opening its mouth and sending out great sounds, the sounds of a foghorn, again and again and ships far at sea, not finding the light, not seeing anything, but passing and hearing late that night, must have thought, there it is, the lonely sound, the lonesome bay horn. All's well, we've rounded the cape. And so it went for the rest of that night. The sun was hot and yellow the next afternoon when the rescuers came out to dig us from our stoned under cellar. It fell apart, is all, said Mr. McDonne gravely. We had a few bad knocks from the waves, and it just crumbled. He pinched my arm. The next year they built a new lighthouse, but by that time I had a job in the little town and a wife and a good, small, warm house that glowed yellow on autumn nights, the doors locked, the chimney puffing smoke. As for McDonn, he was master of the new lighthouse, built to his own specifications, out of steel-reinforced concrete. Just in case, he said. The monster? It never came back. I sat in my car, listening. I couldn't see the lighthouse or the light standing out in Lonesome Bay. I could only hear the horn, the horn, the horn. It sounded like the monster calling. I sat there, wishing there was something I could say. That was The Foghorn by Ray Bradbury, read by Sean Barrett. Ray Bradbury's short stories are produced by Matt Thompson and are a Rocket House production for BBC Radio.